global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is rising as a result of human activity. This rise has major implications for plant productivity and physiology, as well as soil and ecosystem processes. FACE, or Free Air Carbon Dioxide Enrichment Systems, are an effective means to study the response of intact ecosystems and their plants, soils, and small animal components to rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. This map shows many of the FACE experiments from around the world. A list of FACE experiments can be found at the website shown here. Today we will visit several of the FACE experiments shown in this map, and we will see video footage from two well-known FACE experiments, one at the Duke Forest in North Carolina and one on the prairie in Wyoming. Both of these experiments are currently out of use because the government stopped providing funding for FACE research. We'll start at the Duke Forest Face Experiment, the first face ever established in a forest ecosystem. This experiment was established in 1994 and ran until 2010. Let's go take a look at how this experiment was set up and carried out. The Forest Atmosphere Carbon Transfer and Storage, or FACE site, is an outdoor research facility located in Duke Forest. For more than 20 years, a multinational, multidisciplinary group of scientists have been studying the effects of carbon dioxide on forests and plants in relation to climate change. When these scientists share their findings, a picture of a wide range of outcomes that result from exposure to high levels of carbon dioxide begins to emerge. At the face site, Stands of trees are exposed to levels of carbon dioxide that we can expect to experience in the near future. Elevated carbon dioxide warms the Earth's atmosphere, but it is also used by plants during photosynthesis. So you might think of elevated carbon dioxide levels as a sort of fertilizer. In the main experiment on loblolly pines, small stands of trees are exposed to elevated levels of carbon dioxide and paired with a control group of trees that is not exposed. The carbon dioxide, stored in a large tank on site, is mixed with air and pumped through a system of PVC pipes surrounding the trees and the test plots. These exposed trees receive exactly 200 parts per million above the natural concentration of carbon dioxide found in their environment. This difference in concentration between the exposed and the unexposed tree stands is closely monitored and adjusted ensuring the exposed stands always maintain this consistent elevated level of carbon dioxide. The concentration of carbon dioxide and several other important parameters are measured from tall towers above the trees. This allows scientists to get well mixed samples at different elevations. There is a constant flow of information from the trees, including measurements of atmospheric variables and carbon dioxide levels. Instrument readouts are compiled by a computer on site. Data collection of some of the same parameters also happens via satellite. It is a challenge to compare the satellite data to the data gathered on the ground. Since the trees are not isolated, scientists also study the effects of elevated carbon dioxide on many other related plants, animals, and soil factors. At predetermined times, samples of the trees are harvested and a variety of measurements related to the growth and health of the tree are made by examining samples of leaves, bark, and other tissues. Information collected from the face site and other sites like it throughout the world help give a more complete picture of what the impact of climate change is likely to be on forests and crops and the potential for these plants to reduce the impact of climate change in the future. Before we go any further, it's important to note the difference in face technology between the Duke Forest site and other sites that we will visit today. At the Duke Forest site, carbon dioxide was mixed with air before being blown into the rings. But soon after the development of the Duke face site, researchers developed a new, more efficient face technology. Instead of mixing carbon dioxide with air and blowing it into the rings, Pure carbon dioxide can be pumped in through microscopic holes, 
which cause carbon dioxide to be ejected at supersonic speed. This method maximizes the mixing of carbon dioxide with ambient air without the use of blowers. It improves the efficiency of carbon dioxide delivery and also greatly reduces the amount of experimental infrastructure needed. The majority of phase sites developed after the early 2000s used this technology. Global carbon dioxide concentrations are not changing in isolation. There are other global changes occurring as a result of rising carbon dioxide, such as changing temperature and precipitation regimes. Other global changes are occurring simultaneously with rising carbon dioxide, such as nitrogen deposition. In order to better represent expected future conditions, many face experiments include treatments in addition to elevated atmospheric carbon dioxide. At the POP face experiment in central Italy, plots receiving either ambient or elevated carbon dioxide were divided in half, with each half receiving a different level of nitrogen fertilizer. Those halves were further divided into three subsections, each planted with a different species or clone of poplar. This experimental design allowed researchers to test the effects of elevated carbon dioxide and nitrogen additions on different species of poplar in a fully replicated factorial design. At the Prairie Heating and Carbon Dioxide Enrichment Experiment in Wyoming, experimenters manipulated atmospheric carbon dioxide, temperature, and soil moisture. Let's visit the Wyoming FACE site now to see how it was done. This is the northern mixed grass prairie. It is a place where winds sweep across the prairie and through the ever-moving blanket of native grasses. It is really classic Wyoming, classic western U.S. Researchers from the USDA's Agricultural Research Service and from the University of Wyoming and Colorado State University are studying how increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide and climate change are influencing native grasslands. CO2 concentrations have increased from around 285 parts per million at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to around 385 to 390 parts per million today. And as a result, uh, global surface temperatures increased about three quarters of a degree uh, centigrade in the last century. Every five seconds it's actually recording data of the CO2 concentration in this particular plot. This project, called the Prairie Heating and CO2 Enrichment Experiment, simulates projected climate changes to see how the grassland responds. So I'm collecting leaf material from this particular aster, which is called Rigeron pumilis. Um, this is something we're doing for all the species at the site. The purpose is to measure the leaf traits, to try to determine whether or not the, the way in which the plants produce leaves can be used to predict the species' responses to the global changes. CO2, temperature, and soil water are manipulated in 30 experiment plots to evaluate how climate changes will impact critical soil and plant attributes. The roots affect, of course, everything. They, they affect water uptake, nutrient uptake, um, carbon in the soil. Some plots represent present day conditions. That particular species is really thriving in future environments while others are CO2 enriched and heated to simulate the rangeland environment decades from now. Some findings are troubling. Temperature by itself increases biological activity as you increase temperatures, um, but uh, temperature also can have a desiccating effect. The desiccating or drying effect is a concern when it comes to an already dry region. Moisture is really important in these rangeland systems, um, it's often a, a very limiting resource and so the plants respond to rain events um, as well as event um, drought periods. But not all of the results are negative. Surprisingly, researchers are finding carbon dioxide does more to counteract warming and desiccation than once thought. As a result, the soil water and plant growth are actually much the same in present and future environments. CO2 by itself can be viewed as a kind of fertilizer for plants. So you increase the CO2 concentration, plants have higher photosynthesis, they have higher growth. 
Uh, CO2 also improves water use efficiency of plants. Um, so that also is a benefit to some plants, especially in semi-arid grasslands. The nutrients these plants need to survive are also changing in the CO2 enriched settings. As the CO2 increases, um, the plants grow more, they take up more of the nitrogen out of the soil and they might potentially um, sort of bind up or, or remove the nitrogen from being available. One of the most common responses we see in CO2 enrichment experiments is that you get more production, but the plants tend to be diminished in nitrogen. And nitrogen is the foundation element for crude protein. Plants that are protein deficient can decrease livestock performance. Both forage quality and changes in the types of grasses that thrive here are critical to the animals that depend on these grasslands. The combination of higher CO2 concentrations and higher temperatures seems to be favoring the warm season C4 grasses. Uh, this grassland is primarily dominated by cool season grasses, but if the cool season grasses are pushed out because of the warm season grasses, then that might mean that you would have a little less potential for early season livestock grazing. There are reasons to, to expect that climate change might make invasive species more invasive, and that's, that's what we're testing. What do you think about that one? Researchers are finding several invasive plants that are well adapted to and even flourish in the warmer, CO2-enriched settings of the future. This plant here, Dalmatian toadflax, appears to be doing things differently. Um, whereas the, many of the native species take this conservative approach, close their stomates and save water, Dalmatian toadflax leaves its stomates wide open and photosynthesizes more, leading to increased growth. More invasive plants and native grasses that are protein deficient pose nutritional issues for the livestock and wildlife that graze here. The information these researchers gather today is designed in part to help private ranchers and public land managers better steward their lands now and in the future. Knowledge gained from this research program will help to ensure the sustainability of these grasslands in a climate of uncertainty. We really have to determine the best way to, and the most sustainable and responsible way to manage our natural resources to be able to, to feed people, and rangelands are part of that equation. At the Jasper Ridge Global Climate Experiment, run by scientists at Stanford University in California, treatments included elevated carbon dioxide, warming, moisture, and nitrogen deposition. Replicating all of these treatments in a factorial design resulted in 32 individual plots, each with four quadrants. You can see how adding treatments to these experiments can quickly increase the amount of infrastructure and funding required to carry them out. In many cases, constraints on infrastructure and funding make it more feasible to test effects of elevated carbon dioxide and other factors using open-top chambers rather than setting up face experiments. The Old Field Community Climate and Atmospheric Manipulation at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee was an open-top chamber experiment that manipulated atmospheric carbon dioxide, temperature, and moisture. These were administered using chambers to enclose plots with blowers that applied the carbon dioxide and heat at the plot level. The plot level treatments were replicated in a fully factorial design, and each plot was split in half, with one half receiving reduced moisture and the other half receiving ambient moisture. But open top chambers have drawbacks, which we discussed in class, and face experiments are widely accepted as a more effective way to study elevated carbon dioxide. The fact that multiple highly sophisticated face experiments have been set up in different ecosystems around the world goes to show how integral these experiments are to our ability to predict ecosystem responses to changes in our atmosphere and climate. The face research that has been done shows that elevated carbon dioxide may ultimately increase soil carbon stores, but this will strongly depend on soil nutrient availability. The big challenge that remains is to understand and quantify the interactive effects of elevated carbon dioxide and all of the other global changes that are occurring on plant and soil processes.
We hope you enjoyed today's lab and learned a lot about how and why scientists set up face experiments. To recap, we learned about face experiments comparing ambient and elevated carbon dioxide treatments, including the Duke Forest face site, face experiments with additional treatments such as warming and drought, and we saw examples from POP face, the Wyoming face, and JRGCE, and we learned that face experiments require a lot of funding and infrastructure for success.